but now we're going to talk about access to capital. Because quite frankly, if there is no money to invest in emerging companies, in commercialization, or in the growth of companies, they will not grow. Or worse, they will not grow here. So with that, I would like to invite our next panel to join me on the stage. And come on up. And they're going to be seated at these lovely chairs. And, and as they're being seated, let me tell you a little bit about them. Not a stranger to most of you, Marianne Guerrera serves on the, as chairman of the board and chief executive officer and co-founder of BioXL. BioXL is a uniquely unique and fully independent nonprofit organization created to provide funding and business expertise to develop early stage life science technologies that drive local economic development efforts. Paul Jackson is an entrepreneur. He's an angel investor and he's an aerospace engineer. His expertise and ex entrepreneurial spirit are the driving features behind um, both the founding of Integris Capital and the co-founding of its flagship offering, offerings, Worthworm and D-Strut. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Worthworm today. And last but definitely not least, I think Kelly gets the award for coming the furthest. <laughs> Kelly Sloan is um, joining us today from Washington, D.C. She is Vice President for Life Science Policy with the National Venture Capital Association. Kelly, welcome to Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. And as I join the panel, would you please give them a big round of applause? <laughs> welcome. It's great to have all of you here with us today. And We've had a chance to spend some time together, but I know that the audience is going to be really excited to hear some of the things that you guys have to say. And, um, you know, Marianne, why don't you kick us off and just give me a little bit of, you know, as we look at the funding pathway, okay, the people that have the most trouble really getting started are those early stage companies. What are you seeing here in Arizona today? Well, I think that's the biggest challenge that we face in Arizona. We've got um, investment and we've doubled the research uh, dollars over the last few years. Um, and, um, you know, we're struggling on the venture side of it, but the pipeline of dollars to move something from late stage research to, um, you know, into commercialization is almost non existent here in the state of Arizona. Uh, we call it like a, the quarter inch pipe trying to get through that valley of death. Um, I was in uh, San Francisco last week and it was very interesting because they said um, one in 100 um, startup companies will get angel funding and of those 100 that get um, angel funding, only one in 100 will get venture funding. So when you look at those numbers, um, and that's, you know, um, not Arizona, <laughs> I think we're worse, um, that they, there's a real challenge. So um, we have got to figure a way of helping our entrepreneurs get some of that early startup dollars. And I think they need to be thinking creatively because um, even in our uh, portfolio, which is only about 10 companies, um, they think that angel funding is going to come pretty quickly. And so they, um, they don't file for SBIRs or other grants because they say SBIRs take 9 to 12 months. Um, but it's taking them 12 months or more to even get angel funding. Um, and so we're really trying to encourage the companies that we come across or in our portfolio is to think about approaching these in, you know, a, a multi, um, multi-disciplinary, multi-fashion, you know, go for angels, go for uh, government funding, go for state funding, um, continue to develop your personal networks, uh, work with incubators, groups like ours. So um, it's a challenge, um, but I think we've got to um, have Arizona, um, the municipalities, um, you know, step up and help those early startup companies uh, so that we can see um, the long-term economic impact of those successful companies here. Great. And I think, you know, the collaborative, and, and you and I get together on a regular basis with other leaders to really work on this problem. Right. And, you know, right now we have applications are open statewide for members of um, our community to meet with NIH and NSF program managers to talk about the SBIR program. And we also have the opportunity to 
um, come together with the White Hat Conference where we have the VCs coming in. And that's all important. But at the, in that early stage, Paul, you're an investor and you're an entrepreneur. You've sat on both sides of the table. Okay. They never seem to see eye to eye. <laughs> you're working on that problem. Would you give us a little bit on how that works? Absolutely, um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and meet you folks. And um, we are from Scottsdale as well. And um, being a, uh, um, a self-professed nerd in a sense, uh, <laughs> I've come at this um, problem, I guess, from a, uh, a perspective of, uh, of data, thinking about are there ways to improve um, and have insight into risk that's associated with early stage investments? And is it possible to create an environment where an entrepreneur and an angel investor could be better prepared to have the conversation about valuation in particular? But it's, it's just started from, I, I think, a, a, a fascination with, um, you know, are there techniques out there that people don't, aren't aware of that can be used to um, help understand risk and opportunity. And um, so just myself and, and a few other guys and gals that we know, we've, we've invested over $8 million in the last four years into technologies to help us understand better uh, the risk that may be associated with early stage investments. And one of those products is called Worthworm. And um, we also have invested in some CIA technology that's based on uh, artificial intelligence and agents that help uh, look for risk within deals. So we're coming at it very much from a data perspective. We're saying, are there ways to bring technologies to this, to this business space that would increase the probability of financing or make at least the, the conversations around valuation and risk more productive and, and less stressful? And so uh, Worthworm is one of those tools it's a, uh, essentially, it's a SaaS-based tool. It's very inexpensive for entrepreneurs to fill out a, a questionnaire about their, their entity and ultimately answer questions uh, where they feel most comfortable and, and confident and where they feel less confident. And then we've inter integrated some technology out of Boeing, uh, it's called Real Options, into that analysis, and, and, we've, and this product is now online. And Kelly, you know, it's great to, to see the early stage stuff happening. We have to fill that pipeline. Obviously, the VCs are not coming in at that point. But, um, you know, once they mature, what's it look like out there? Well, I just want to first thank, thank you for inviting me out here. It's, it's great to be out in Arizona. What a beautiful um, um, place you live. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to just do that little shout out. Um, I think it's really important to look at the whole ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem. And it, it, you know, it remains very challenging for the venture capital industry. It always has on, you know, with states like Arizona, like you say, but I think it's, there's even more pressure right now because I think it's really important to step back and see what's happening as a venture capital industry. Um, in 2013, um, the number of venture capital firms and dollars are literally cut in half since the tech bu bubble. So number one, there's half the amount of dollars across the country that's going into this space. And number two, specifically in life science, um, where I think it was about in 08, um, life science investment was about 30% of overall venture capital. Last year, it was down to 17 uh, um, yeah, 17, 17%, no, no, 22, 22%. So you're seeing this real, you know, overall drop um, in investment um, in life sciences. So it's not just these pockets, it's just this systemic problem. Why is that happening? I think we all know. It's the time and cost of device and medical um, and drug development. And the limited partners who are private pension funds and and educational endowments who we want, you know, for them to thrive, they simply are not looking at venture capital as a, uh, you know, like they used to as a, as a high risk capital. They're, it's shrinking, particularly in life sciences. Um, there's, you know, 
you know, institutional investors that have always given and contributed to life sciences, who the investors come back and say, you know, we want you know, to raise another fund, and they simply say, we can't, we just can't do it. So I think it's really important to realize kind of the overall issue with what's happening there. Um, you know, we need to work together on why is that happening? What can we do to improve that? I think there was a big positive uptick last year with the IPO market, and that, that's the good news, uh, specifically in the biotech space where we saw the most IPOs that we have in many, many years. Half of those, more than half of them, were in the biotech space. Why did that happen? From our perspective, um, many of those companies were, you know, you know, very mature companies that have been you know, in the pipeline for many years, but we believe the Job, Jobs Act and FDA reform um, has really helped jumpstart. Um, especially in the biotech space, there was a little uptick in first-time investment, which I think, getting back to your point, really looking at that first-time investment for companies trend. And um, you're starting to see a slight uptick in the biotech space, but in the medical device space, it is just a, a continued decline. And in fact, there are some estimates to say that over the next five years, 70% of investors that invest in medical device companies will either have already left or already left or will be leaving um, as an investor in the medical device space. So that, that's a real concerning trend that we've got to turn around. I think from an optimistic perspective, however, living in Washington, I do think the FDA is really turning the ship around, especially in the leadership, and you're starting to see a lot of flexible models of getting, getting um, um, you know, um, d drugs and devices approved, but we still have a long way to go there, and reimbursement is obviously a big, big challenge. Okay, great. Thanks, Kelly. And, you know, the process that we have to go through is hard. There's no industry that has to face the hurdles that our industry has to face to bring a product to market. There's a glimmer of hope right now with the 21st Century Cures initiative um, where we have very, very powerful leaders in Washington who are bringing together leaders from industry, leaders from the regulatory base, et cetera, to work on what's called the 21st Century Cures initiative. Google it, watch those videos. See what they're talking about and see what they're talking about doing. Um, you'll find some pretty interesting stuff that's happening and some of it that's happening right here in Arizona. So as we look at um, each stage of that capital pathway, um, what are some of the things that you, the investors are looking for Universally, it, you've said it's hard at the early stage. It's hard at the mid stage. It's hard at the end. So if I want to be competitive and get my shot, what do I have to do inside my company to make me look good? Marianne, you want to kick us off? You know, I'm, I'm struggling here because I have to behave and answer all these questions, and I want to say other <laughs> things. So, um, you know, listening to what we, we've talked about here, um, I think we do have to look at new approaches and new ways of doing that. And, um, you know, that was when we formed BioXL, it was the reason is how do you create early stage companies, take out some of that risk by, you know, putting in early capital, holding them to outcomes, tranching their money by milestones, watching them and pushing them, monitoring their outcomes so that you're making sure that if they say they're going to do this clinical study, they're going to have that done by a certain date and that's the study that needs to be done to go to FDA. Uh, because with the early stage companies, they've got so many things that they have to face um, that sometimes they're very linear in their thinking and say, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this, and they can't. They have to worry about FDA. They have to worry about product development. They have to worry about raising funds. And so you need organizations you know, such as ours and others that really can help them navigate that system to think about, okay, well, you're not getting angel dollars, so we need to help get SBIR dollars. So if we can do a better job at taking out some of that early risk, working with the angels so that they see that, they see the diligence that's gone through. So in BioXL, you know, we, we do that. We put 
uh, proof of concept dollars. So first we validate the technology, then we precede it if they're successful. Those types of things really play into um, you know, somebody wanting to do downstream funding. Um, you've taken out the risk. The other thing we've really seen is understanding the market and your customer. And that sounds kind of simple, but they don't talk to the customer. And so they've got a great technology. They think anybody's going to, and everybody's going to buy it for this unreasonable cost. <coughs> And it's not going to happen. They're not going to get reimbursed. Um, and nobody wants to buy their product. So lean, launch pad, you hear about that. Getting people and getting the early stage companies to talk to customers. Know what their product is. Know that early before they start spending a lot of money and finding out at the end nobody wants to buy it. Kelly, you know, and you hang around with a lot of investors at all different levels all around the country. And we hear it's all about the team. You have to have the right team, and if it's the right team, and then six months later, it's, it's all about the value proposition, and the next time, it's all about the uniqueness. Okay, guys, you know, Kelly, what are you hearing? What, what's, the, what's the hot trend these days? The hot trend is everything, <laughs> um, but I, the, what I hear the most now is how are, how are you going to get your product reimbursed, and is it going to um, bring value to the healthcare system and save costs? If you, don't, if, you, if you can't show that, then they're not going to invest. Um, I want to build a little bit off what you said and, and how to help entrepreneurs. And again, I'm, I come from the public policy side here, so I'm not an investor. But I am actually really excited. I want to bring some good, good excitement. Is I really do believe in Washington, and this is where the VCs are thinking, and I think from a public policy perspective, we're, we're trying to help is what we're trying to help Washington understand, FDA, Congress, and the payers, is that the innovation is starting for these young companies. And they can't do it all together. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have these big answers to solve for our healthcare system. And we know that if we solve diabetes or whatever, that's going to save you know, you know, you know, patient time and healthcare costs. But nobody's investing in those large diseases because we just can't. No one can. And so what we're really trying to promote is flexible regulatory processes for startup companies and payment. So approve a product if you have a certain indication for a subpopulation of a disease group. Look at that and look at that from a pay, both a reimbursement side and a payment perspective and get you know, a, an approval and agreement of a certain payment if you agree to do post-market studies. And then it, it's easier for um, a company, a young company, to be able to, to start there with the commitment of doing these studies, but you've got to do the studies and then see how that evolves. And I think you're, you'd see more investment flow into those types of models, and that's you know, really important for a, a lot of patients you know, of areas of unmet medical need. And then if it proves to be right, then you start expanding it to the larger population. So that's one of the things I think is getting some traction in Washington that I, I see some encouragement around that I think will really help young startup companies. Paul, you made the transition from entrepreneur to investor. Mm -hmm. okay. What can we do as the industry here in Arizona to encourage more potential investors locally mm -hmm. to learn about our industry and see if maybe they want to stick their toe in the water? Mm. It's, a, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure I, I know the answer. I, um, I think that investors are looking for opportunities that return their capital and return it again. Um, and maybe once more in the next two to three years. And I think um, it's about good deal flow. Um, it's about um, deal full flow in my mind that has been uh, uh, architect or been put together in an intelligent manner. Um, uh, I think that it's much wiser to invest in a portfolio of investment opportunities and make uh, allocations of capital in a, uh, in a way that, uh, that has some um, data behind it, uh, comps or something else, uh, some understanding 
Um, and I think it's about uh, having managers that understand the importance of, of managing a company for value um, as opposed to necessarily for sales or for getting through the next two to three months. Um, it's about having uh, people that understand the long-term perspective and, and ultimately knowing what it is that drives valuations. Um, having some uh, understanding of what's important. Um, the, uh, to tag off of what was said earlier, it, it is, all of those things are important. It is about the management team. It is about your sales distribution channels. It's about your market size. It's about ma market segmentation and, and how confident you are in all of those things. And, but that's a, um, it's a, it's a nonlinear, um, it's a differential equation that's nonlinear and, and, and very difficult to understand and get your arms around. And I think it takes um, people uh, knowing the need of an, of an angel investor, which is to get his money back, um, and, and entrepreneurs to present opportunities to those angel investors that um, are meaningful and, um, and, and that have a higher chance of success. Our cities and towns you know, have been very active and very interested in growing this industry. There's not a mayor that I talk to that doesn't ask me, how can I get the biosciences, life sciences, healthcare, medical device into my community? So, Marianne, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, we've had a, a wonderful experience in Peoria by setting up a medical device accelerator um, where we wanted to focus on how do we move things more quickly through the pipeline um, and wrap the expertise for those companies in an important industry in the United States. Um, the city has been terrific in terms of willing to take some risks, willing to understand um, a focus. So rather than trying to be everything to everybody, they focused on medical devices and have allowed us to um, form and embed programs into the operation that provide seed funding and um, proof of concept. So I think the cities have to, um, it's not just buildings, you know, it's just not a, an incubator facility that's gonna do it. Um, the one thing, just to, to follow on what was said here, um, when you look at where the industry is headed these days, um, with the, the payers, the providers, and everything that's going on. We've got to have companies that are working with the payers and providers to say what are the problems that are facing the United States, the public. And then we need to figure out what are those novel technologies that we can bring to bear to solve the problems. We don't have the resources to just do what we want to do anymore. We have to be focused. And I think the cities have a real opportunity to work with us to say, what are those unmet needs? Um, you know, I was with Blue Cross Blue Shield and GE Ventures last week um, talking about how do we really understand defining those needs and then getting our wonderful entrepreneurs to come to solve the problem. So I think the cities can think about that because I think, as you said, it's a value proposition. When you understand what the problem is, you can see a solution to it. You can see the impact it has. Um, and they do want data. They want to know, is it going to reduce the cost? Is it going to simplify the care? Is it going to make it less complex? And the, the most frightening thing that I heard last week was um, providers saying, we don't care if it's approved by the FDA. Right. We want to see the data to they show that show. you've reduced the cost, cost, you've improved the quality of care, and you've simplified yeah. the delivery of the care. It's so true. that is, you know, we can fix FDA, but if they're still not <laughs> going to reimburse and pay, yeah. we're in trouble. So we got to think That's of all so those true. things together, and then we, the cities have to help us execute. I think. So, I think just building on that and what you guys are doing with the White Hat Investors Conference is bringing the ecosystem together and having a conversation with everybody, the, all the players, you know, the, the payers. What do you need? What are the areas of unmet medical? And just what you were saying and, and having a, a forum here that really have a conversation with the entire ecosystem to say we all, we all care about this. We all come in these different pockets. Here is a city that really is prioritizing this. What can we do together and get a plan together um, to move that forward? And you know what, Kelly? I don't think I could have come up with a better closing for this panel 
than what you just said. <laughs> so you know, as Kelly mentioned, the White Hat Life Science <laughs> Investor Conference <laughs> is the first ever oh, the Life Science Investor Conference to be held in Arizona. It, that's amazing, guys. And during the course of today, you make sure that you stop by and you thank Kelly Sloan because <laughs> Kelly has been um, an amazing partner at the National Venture Capital Association to help us pull this together. And some of the biggest names in the country are going to be at that conference. So deadline for applications is July the 7th, it's July the 15th. And I do not want to have one company come up to me in September and say, well, there's no, there's no money in Arizona. We are bringing the money to Arizona. It is your job to build and pitch the companies that's deserving of that money. So when I get back from bio next week, I expect to see a lot of applications from Arizona companies <laughs> in that database, or I'm going to start spamming you every day. <laughs> and you know I will. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give our panel an amazing round of applause for all that they care about.